rather than using codes uh, amongst your colleagues, which aren't being intercepted, means nothing. It's gibberish. Right, but five this is by why you five. You haven't won a war in a while, right? <laughs> you son of a bitch. Five by five <laughs> in the pipe is six syllables. Well, hey, me... I'm on my flight plan is like a million syllables, if my right, math well, is right. Uh, five by five on the pit, and then I've got to think about what's well, five by five, I and mean, that's square, right? And then the pit, oh, oh, that. Do I have to do that thought with the other one, Bo? <laughs> it's all right. Look, welcome to Duncan and Bo uh, Come Correct. This season, uh, and, and the end of the first season of, of this Thank nonsense. Christ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, Duncan and Bo slash fiction. Our look at the first season of Slasher. Um, what a long, strange trip it's been, uh, Duncan. Um, oh. Yeah. Every two weeks, so like this has been a 16-week journey. Yes, it's taken us four months to get through the first season, if uh, my math is right on that. And, uh, yep. you know, that feels right. Yep. You know. That that's the proper <laughs> oh what what horrible tortures I have for you <laughs> sixteen weeks <laughs> doled out slowly oh so slowly exactly. that's what Uncle Frank Skinned was watching in that room when he wrote Help Me I'm in Hell it was just season one a slasher yeah <laughs> on the TV in the background hi did hi you yeah. oh Cam I love you oh you're a killer. Uh, so, so we'll, skinned and forth to bathe in lemon water. Oh, oh my or, god! What slasher? I would bathe in lemon water skinned. So no, you would not. I but, fuck it. That was painful. It's, it's not good. It's not good. And we're look. <laughs> it's we're not good, Duncan. It's what I'm saying. Is it's not good. I, nobody is gonna is gonna stand and or sit here and no. try to defend season one of slasher as a good program i would love to hear them try however duncan yes i i propose to you that oh, I've, i accept i've wow current's <laughs> gonna enough. be very upset i <laughs> so, yeah different time zones so it doesn't count oh uh, oh yeah i got gotcha. you international rose bowl five by five in the pipe and um, so I'm sure I, yeah. that's what that means yeah that's that that means butt stuff yes that's, that's exactly um, what i thought so <laughs> anyway it's, Duncan, silly it's gonna be a silly one yeah silly oh the, but what i was getting is i've had a good time doing these shows like i i always look forward to to the shows mm -hmm. um but yes, it it was an especially difficult journey through the season because it's hard to give a shit about a show that doesn't give a shit about itself. You know, yes, it's it's yes. why most relationships fail. Quite frankly, Duncan, <laughs> it's because you need to care about yourself before somebody else can care about you. And much the same way, I feel like taking Slasher aside and being like, Slasher, you need to take a swim in a big old lake, you for a yeah. little while. And learn to care about you as a show before you uh, come back to the airwaves. Yeah, so. or, or like just maybe just read what you've written first and just see if it makes sense. I mean, I'm just, you know, just see if it all adds up. <laughs> yeah, see if any of it makes sense. And yeah. also ask yourself this question. Does every character that I've introduced have a payoff in some way, or at least mm -hmm. we send them off in a way that, that feels somewhat satisfying? Uh, no? Well, maybe it's time to, you know, take another pass at it. Yeah. Write uh, that script, put it in a box, put that box away for six months, come back and mm -hmm. cold read it and That's see right. how you feel. Don't write that script. Don't proofread it. Don't do anything. Green light a show and then get halfway through it before you're like, eh. <laughs> Well, let's just keep going. We've got the money. I mean, yeah, this will end up on Netflix, um, right? So, one day David Cronenberg will be on this show. <laughs> I still don't know how this is making sense. I hey, right out with Canada, out with Canada. I I feel like either it, they just shot it in his house, <laughs> or or you think you think david cronenberg is an unwilling participant so the gorilla <laughs> shot around his property and he's just in the background like i don't know cooking hot dogs or something it's much the same way that they shot uh the movie in bowfinger where no one really knows that they're in a movie 
<laughs> and like when it came out, David Cronenberg was like, I'm in what? I'm in a, a, a program called Slasher. No, that's not right. I mm. would remember that. Uh, Did Brandon set you up? Did, yeah, is, they, is he responsible for this? Remember uh, when the really bad actress bumped into you at the grocery store? Yes, I do remember that. You were being filmed. Oh, no. It was, it was all a ruse, David Cronenberg. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. Um, we will... I am, But I'm curious to see the evolution from, like, this season. I want to know what these other seasons are like. Because I've heard... Like, I've heard it's worse. So, the evolution yeah. is a bad evolution. That's a, a, but but it's got to at least be evolving. different. Yeah. The evolution? I don't know what the word Devolution. is. Devo, right? Devo. Devo. Do, 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 do. Are, we, are we men? No, we are Duncan and Bo. Um, we are Duncan and Bo. So. <laughs> I've got, somewhere or another, I've got that shirt, the uh, are we men? No, we are Devo. Uh, T. Anyway, doesn't matter. I'm not giving it away. I don't even know why I brought it up. You, just bragging. Uh, I, yeah, if anything, just, you're flaunting your money, Bo. Just, I have this t-shirt that I don't wear that nobody will see. Uh, so. Listen to Rockefeller over here with all his, <laughs> his evil t-shirts. vanity t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I bid you two seconds to look at my Devo t-shirt collection. Right. In the Devo wing of my house. <laughs> and then the door will close again for another five years. <laughs> <laughs> right it's like panic room um it's like a big safe door where you use one of those ones that are in the back with a big wheel that you have to turn yeah. around yeah, yeah i love it everything that's happening right now is legitimately true that's it's, what's in both house the, right most importantly everything that we're saying is true um true. yeah so uh here's the thing though we're not going to jump right into the next season of slash because we're not fucking sadists <laughs> well technically that would be masochists uh, either or, neither nor. I'm making you watch it, and you're making me watch it, so I can work both ways. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so <laughs> what I, our listeners are making us watch it, so definitely. Uh, you know, I if we took a poll, I'd be curious, and we're not if going we took, to. Yeah, if we took a poll, I know what the outcome would be. Duncan and Bo should watch more slasher. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It would, yeah, it would be like you need to watch these specific episodes because mm -hmm. those are the worst, and we want to see you suffer. Yes, you pretty know. much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, what episodes I have to show you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> but what we're gonna do for a little bit of a a, a bump in between, a little bit of a power. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. I, I know. This is Pinhead stand-up comedy routine. Hello. <laughs> a man walks into a bar. Oh no, it's an iron bar out <laughs> my head. <laughs> Remember to tip your waiter. <laughs> ah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. A horse the walks into a bar. The bartender says, why the long face? Because he is a horse and he has a long face. Not that he has been trapped in this, a strange machine tortured which tore his face long as Jesus wept. That would be the movie and not the horse. <laughs> <coughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> It was like I choke on your bad joke, Duncan, and impression. No, that was my impression of the audience. <laughs> it's good. It's very yeah, good. Yeah, pretty good. So here's what we're going to do. And I, I could not be more excited yes. to, to reveal what our, our sort of interstitial, hey, let, let's just goof off for an episode episode is going to be. <laughs> let's have some me time. Yeah. How about, how about, how about Doug and Abo just enjoy themselves for once? How about that, everybody? Would yeah, the, is that so wrong? Well, there was conflicting ideas. We've went with your idea because ultimately you edit the shows, so I kind of have to go with your idea. Sure. My idea was a luxury spa mm -hmm. weekend where we get uh, Manny Patties, and um, I was I was very much looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, facials, and, you know, we, we, we dine on some nice food. We have some uh, delicious uh, cava wine mm -hmm. um, to sit down and have a, a nice, like, a nice organic breakfast Um uh, and you know like just be treated like the kings that we are Bo. and then you told us that sadly all the money has went into the production of these shows so there ain't no money left over because people aren't buying enough t-shirts buy the t-shirts um so we can get that spa day ladies and gents so yeah. instead what we've opted for is your backup plan which in hindsight is much more practical and doesn't involve us breaking any international laws or any laws in general um or being brought up on charges of indecency so but what is the idea what we're we doing in two weeks time in two weeks time 
Uh, Duncan and I will be doing a a review of the 1981 uh, record album Duran Duran, the LP. first release from the band Duran Duran. We will be going track by track. Uh, discussing each one, the merits of each. Uh, some longtime listeners may be aware Duncan and I uh, enjoy the Duran Duran. And yeah. so I, you know, I don't know how many of these uh, we're going to do. Uh, you know, Duran Duran put out a lot of records. I say we get to Seven and the Ragged Tiger at least. Oh, I mean, a, a minimum. Yeah. A so, minimum. you know, and hey, ordinary worlds out there so it is it, it's out there to be claimed so yeah. we, we will eventually get to it's only a matter of time yeah so but okay so here's the thing um uh, is that because of copyright issues <laughs> next week's show will not because be live yeah, well, because we can't just play duran duran music live as much as we want to and just yes. have like no audio for us as we just dance around like fucking idiots right um that is that that can't happen but um, and also duran duran are on a major record label yes. that will sue the shit out of us and as large as dbcc or dumbo co is yeah um it, it, you know i can't take on a, a warner brothers or a sony music just no not a, a moment. not a multinational like that we don't we don't not have those moment, kind of lawyers a couple of years Couple, uh, yeah, yeah. Give us time, us. and we need to move some shirts. Like you said, that was a uh, well, well said. Um, Thank you. Always have fun, though. Nice. A B A B H. Um, <laughs> so it's a weird way of spelling now, but yeah. Uh, but there we go. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is not to say that you will not be seeing a video show. We're mm -hmm. just going to be recording it and then editing editing it in such a way that we can bring it to you without uh you know getting sued or blocked so yes. <laughs> so yeah but yet you will th this time in two weeks at this regular time slot uh you will you will get uh D duncan and Bo versus duran duran and uh i'm excited look hey there's some bangers on that first album yeah and uh you know girl girls on film is one of them we will we will be talking anyway I, I couldn't be more excited it is totally off topic for us but kind of off topic is what we do um yeah, we've, we've kind of made a history and career of just doing off topic so. it's kind of the basis of this show is hey we have to do a bunch of other stuff <laughs> how about when we do a thing together it's just whatever the fuck we want to do yeah. um <laughs> so you know welcome welcome to the fuckery um I think that was a Panic at the Disco song. Welcome, welcome to the, the yeah. Black for Fuckery. Yes, uh, could very well be. At any rate, let's start the show as we normally do, Duncan, with uh, a quick summary of uh, some movies we've been seeing. One good, one bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's uh, let's kick it over to you. How do you want to start this thing off? Hey, I'll start with a good. Um, now, this has a caveat. I've not been watching a lot of films um well not films that we could necessarily just sit down and chat about on this show uh, and that i'm doing a lot of kind of stuff right now in terms of prep for summer series and i don't want to give sure. too much away on that uh but um i did manage to sit down and a uh, partake and here's, here's the the world i live in has a list of about 50 tv shows that people have recommended that i watch it's an extensive list. It keeps getting added to. So when the opportunity is afforded to me to start a new TV show, what do I do? I pick a show that's not on that list, bro. Mm -hmm. um, because I hate everyone. You should um, watch Ted Lasso, but go on. You told me, and it was on the list, bro, and it's not been watched. Instead, what I opted to do, mostly off the back of the fact I'm playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla a lot at the moment, um, I started watching that Vikings TV show. Are you aware of this? I yeah, yeah I, I somebody explained the what is it the blood wings or whatever, and I was like, I know, I saw Pumpkinhead too. Yeah, and that's that is a real thing as well. Um, although mm, we're gonna get to mm, we're gonna get to uh, <laughs> um, and so I, I'm just gonna preface it by saying really enjoying it. Uh, first season had some primo kind of head Errol chieftain action by one Gabriel Byrne who I just he's, he has pretty much a mullet. And I'm like, that is the Gabriel Byrne I want forever. Um, <clears throat> he's also a baddie. Uh, so, he's, he, uh, so, yeah, so I, I've been enjoying it. 
It is, however, for a show that the History Channel put out, maybe one of the most... It's up there with Braveheart in terms of one of the most grossly, historically inaccurate programmes I have ever fucking seen. Like, ever seen. Like, the show sets up, like, the very first episode, they're setting up, like, none of the Vikings know that England exists. They just know that there's no, there's nothing to the West. It's like the flat Earth theory. Like, if you see yeah. the West, you fall off the edge of the Earth. And I'm like... Mm, right let me just mm, no like the saxons had already invaded the the romans for one had been to england the saxons had invaded england saxons are germans so i mean that's just below like that's just below like denmark you, yeah you think word would have gotten out but all right and it would have because there was trading routes about a hundred years before the legend of uh uh, was it ragnar lothbrok so Duncan, they knew. we're trying to make a tv show here we're not yeah, trying to like we're not trying to teach a bunch of kids a bunch of bullshit. But what they could have done is they could have just prefaced it by saying something really, really simple, like, um, you know, that the Earl knew about it but didn't want to sell to it. Or some shit like that. But it's like, he it used the first... Hey, a bunch of this is made up. <laughs> yeah, like, literally, like, they arrive, they arrive on the, like, they, they sail over uh, as an affront to their Earl. This is all first episode yet. And they arrive at a monastery and just fucking ransack the place, murder everyone. Sure. Um, as you do, as Vikings do. I mean, um, as I do when I come across a monastery. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's in like, me. It's the DNA memory, Duncan. Is they, they just the way out the place and it's like, they've never seen these Vikings before. Like, they've never heard them. I'm like, once again, I don't think that's right. Like, so it's just like, just wee things where I'm like, hmm. Like, they, like and they petty shit. They refer to themselves as Vikings. That's not true. They're Northmen. Um, that's how they would have referred to themselves. Vikings is the term of what they do. They go Viking. Um, so, All right, well, it's that... just like shit like that. Like some of the weapons don't make sense. Uh, some of the time period don't make fucking sense. That um, that sounds uh, like a a big asterisk for your good of the week. But, but all right, it is exactly what i want from a tv show minus a historical inaccuracy um it is a show where vikings are talking about the the culture of being vikings <clears throat> and they're you know and then you get to see the raids which they don't skimp back on so they show you you're you're basically following a group of people that do fucking very horrible shit um like the, 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 the wiped out whole towns <laughs> like um did a bit of raping while they were doing it as well um and just they were generally relatively fucking horrible people however um it's, it's good it's good i'm almost finished season one already uh and it's been it's been you know a bit of fun i can, the sad thing about this very much like the whole braveheart thing once again braveheart is not a good movie but anyway um the you know who likes braveheart non-scots uh, like which says everything um so the yeah well, and also mel gibson kind of poisoned that well too it's you know i think braveheart is one of those movies that was really well regarded at the time and my impression is that as time goes on more and more people are like all right we were all a little high on <laughs> mel gibson but you, 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 i think i think people like to romanticize the idea of <clears throat> who William Wallace was. Of course. Uh, very similar to the, the whole yes. Rob Roy movie where I'm like that. Uh, right, right, taking Liam Neeson standing there, you know, yeah, you took my money. I'm going to come for you. Um, you know, as I, I'm watching that, and whilst it's great to see that, uh, first thing, Rob Roy wasn't as tall as Liam Neeson. He was realistically about five foot six, not nine foot ten. Uh, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, fucking unreal. It's like, it's like when, it's like when yeah, Tom but... Cruise played Jack Reacher and you're like, Jack Reacher's like seven foot in the novels. Tom Cruise ain't no seven foot motherfucker, right? Dude's five foot four. Anyway, right? Like, but he was, um, Rob Roy McGregor was a thief. <laughs> yeah. A thief from a band of thief and you know i mean his I first like, name is rob yes yeah right yeah exactly exactly i see it's in the name um so i'm like you know, i watched that i was like there's this kind of romanticized you know what it is it's it's fucking it's billy Connolly has a great skit where he talks about um the highlands being full of english people who love the idea of being scottish and living in the highlands so they all move up and they change their names to, like the first names become surnames 
Like, uh, oh, what's what's Mackenzie doing next week? Oh, Mackenzie's <laughs> hanging around with Cuthbert. Yeah. Uh, you know, like all these like fucking stupid like like that. Like, j- just not Scottish names. Like Scottish surnames is first names because they like the idea of it. And I think that's what those movies are. And Vikings is a uh, a TV show which is basically someone's wet dream about. Um, you know, having no horned helmets as well. That kind of confused me. Vikings wore horned helmets. Yeah, that's one of the things I think about when I think about Vikings. We have historical evidence of that. Um, Also, the long ships don't look right. But uh, anyway, the the, the fun of it is in just the general and the the blood angels you were talking about or the Uh blood eagle or whatever. Um, A practice which is alleged to have happened. But if you read the early text, uh, it was maybe not as gruesome as the later texts that came out. When people did that thing that they like to call embellishing. You know what I mean, Bo? I, I've heard of it. I've never it's engaged probably, in it myself, but probably it probably started off as a nasty paper cut. <laughs> by right. the end, by the end of that Chinese whisper line that was like your lungs are pulled out your back and used as wings. It was a guy who saw an eagle. <laughs> they were like, Who? Jerry? And he was like, Yeah. Did he die? No, no, no. He just say he saw an eagle. He tripped and fell, and he he cut his he cut his leg. I mean, it bled a fair amount though. It was is deep for a leg cut. Deep. Yeah, it was, it was deep. So yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it, but while I'm watching it, I'm like, no, no. And then I could only think to myself, like, this is the history. Like my my, my new my new thing is that I think the History Channel is basically become mtv you know what mtv used to be all about music it's all music all the time and it just became like shows like the osbournes and the hills uh and shit like that and you know like the fucking tina maria's tartan tofu or i don't know it was just like loads of fucking weird shows it was all reality shit that appeared no music anymore i think the history channel's done the same thing because anytime i've ever been on that channel they're talking about alien conspiracy right i, uh, I was gonna say this is not a new thing like there was a whole meme that started years ago about aliens. how the history channel has just become you know it, it's a haven for conspiracy theories and <laughs> Hitler videos. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm kinda I'm kinda confused. Like at the rich pantheon of history that we have out there, like I don't think the history channel has run out of stories to tell. There's plenty Duncan, out there. <laughs> the good news is we learned everything. Oh, that's that's good. So we'll, so, we'll never repeat those same mistakes yeah, again. Why would we? We have a never. whole channel dedicated to telling us how not to. And so, and yeah. we got it. We have message received, Duncan. No mistakes on this end, right. sir. Um, so yeah, it's I, I mean it's 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 fun, trashy TV, which I imagine became greenlit off the back of Game of Thrones. I'm so, sure it must have been. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it for all its inaccuracies. So that's my that's my good with a caveat. Okay, well I'll give you a good without a caveat. Oh, go for it. Uh, I caught up to thanks to Shutter. Finally caught up to Zombie for Sale. Uh, oh, which is so fucking oh, good. What a delightful movie that is. What a what a charmer. I knew you'd like it. Is. I said I said you would like that to me as a uh, that well, that that was made um I'm trying to think what else came out that year from Korea. Oh man, there's like the, the just like the, there was another movie which I, I ranked really, really highly that year from Korea. It was in a similar sort of no, it's not it's Japanese. It came out it was made the same year as One Cut of the Dead. Yeah, which is interesting because there, there's a similar vibe to them. It's not. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think Zombie for Sale is as gimmicky, and I don't mean gimmicky in a bad way at all. I know what you mean. Know you know, you mean. it yeah. just doesn't like uh, One Cut of the Dead has its turn, and and Zombie for Sale isn't trying to play any tricks on the audience or anything. It just it's very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how much that movie is in love with other Korean films yeah it like that is a movie made by korean filmmakers who are like you know what korean movies kind of rock everybody (laughs) we're pretty good at this guys yeah like it turns out we we kind of rule the school when it when it comes to making you know kick-ass genre movies yeah and there are like little touches of even like old boy Mm -hmm. there's that one stairway shot where you're like that is that's a that's a park chan wook shot Mm-hmm. And, and there's a an obvious direct reference to Train to Busan, and like it, it's a movie that loves being what it is, which is a you know sort of this l- kind of a love letter to Korean cinema in a lot of ways, and as well mm-hmm. as being 
a really, you know, kind of well done story about, you know, consumerism and all that kind of thing. Like it does all the things that a zombie movie ought to do, but it also has this, this sort of reverence for, uh, for the, the art form of cinema mm -hmm. and, and, and Korean cinema in particular, but, uh, and it's kind of sweet and dopey and silly and, yeah, it, you know, like it, it, it's got wonderful characters. I really like I, one of the, when I started watching it, one of the things that I fell in love with immediately is when you realize that they're all kind of grifters a little bit. <laughs> every single one of them. Yeah, yeah. Every, every single person in the family is uh, like always looking for an angle. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 like the ultimate fate of the father and everything i thought was wonderful like everything about it, it makes all these little decisions that wouldn't necessarily you know sink the movie if they made the wrong one but man it just like every little detail is just right of like oh that character is so good and oh i you know the detail of oh there's the cop again and now he's all Rah. uh and <laughs> it, anyway it's it's really, really solid, and, and and actually, when it becomes a zombie movie, it's a pretty good zombie movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh yeah, it, it does. It, it handles all those aspects surprisingly. Once it, it, like Korean kind of ability to tell a story which weaves you know, like comedy and drama and romance and action and horror seamlessly, like. They just they craft their sco their stories very very well, and the the greatest traditions of 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 good storytelling. No story should be dry and one style. It should it should weave, and this is the moment that the audience gets behind the character and gets all the. It, it does, but they make it just look so easy. Like it, yeah. was, it was never a thing. You <laughs> know, like I don't know why other people struggle with this. This is so easy to us. Yeah, right. Like wh why doesn't everyone make? Well great movies like this like mm -hmm. you know like even at the beginning when you're seeing those old men for the first time just kind of by the side of the road yeah. watching this kid zombie get chased and stuff mm -hmm. when they're just like is something going on <laughs> this like there seems to be a lot of activity today <laughs> a activity today in a way that that we normally don't have around here um it's really yeah it's such a wonderful little uh film laurie saying it sounds like uh parasite with zombies eh, kinda there's I mean, there's dark humor in it for sure and certainly the family in there she had a bit of dna and yeah in that they are kind of grifting but it's it's like a different well there's no one rich in the in the film if you know what i mean they just happen to be grifters any town which doesn't afford them the opportunity to be ever will ever become rich yeah um, so i uh, you know it's, it's excellent no, if you've not seen it i highly recommend it so i go as go fright fest two years ago and um it almost almost stole the whole weekend for me i come out buzzing about it so but yeah. then i had also seen saint mod uh which i was just like oh two extremes of thought yeah yeah <laughs> like, like, i try but i think they may have been shown on the same day as well i think zombie for sale was played at <laughs> that's um, wise Saint well i was just like yeah you can't do that the other way you can't send me full of joy at that movie please because <laughs> like, it will start it out um <laughs> yeah 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 i mean and you know that's it, i was kind of in the mood and i knew you had uh recommended zombie for sale and and said it was uh a, a really kind of winner of a crowd pleaser of a movie yeah and, and an audience setting like that was like it got laughs all the way through um so yeah i mean that's once again the the ability to take it's a, it's a universal language of comedy as well to be able to get audiences to laugh at things on a completely different part of the world where they've grown up with completely different experiences like they can't relate the same way to a lot of what's in that movie specifically over here when it comes to the dynamic of family and shit so you know what i mean like like eastern cultures the, the you regularly have like three generations living under one roof that doesn't necessarily happen in western cultures so um the ability to, to uh, all that stuff uh, but once again it's just like this is a story it's a great story watch us watch us nail it <laughs> like, uh, yeah and make it look like it was really easy right and also you're gonna gut laugh you know yeah. two or three times you know when Th this poor kid gets hit by a truck and goes flying and stuff and like it's it's 
it, you know, it it manages to be like goofy and heartwarming and kind of like scary and gory at times, mm-hmm. and it's just just terrific. Never a in my life have I wanted to munch down on a cabbage covered in sriracha sauce as much as I did watching that movie. Man, um, that that <laughs> whole sriracha. crazy love story with like the zombie and high ghoul uh, is so. <laughs> And just because she's just a weirdo goth kid, yep. you know? And anyway, it's it, a, a wonderful movie. If, if you're listening to this, uh, you're probably convinced by now, or you never will be. And um, it's on Shudder, you said. It is It is now on Shudder in the U.S., just yeah. uh, landing yeah, this it. week. So there is no excuse to, A, not have Shudder, and B, uh, to to not watch Zombie for Sale on that uh, quite quite fine service. Um. Duncan, it is time then to talk about bad movies. Uh, what, what have you seen? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, once again, another caveat here. Um, I can find the, I, I'm one that finds the charm in this movie, but I regularly admit it is not a good movie. So, go on. And this is, this is not, no, you've seen this movie before, so it's not as if I'm bringing like some fresh tasty dish to the you know the 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 banquet table that you've never had before i'm not saying that the gum that you like is coming back in style bow is what i'm saying um what i'm saying is that if you have the opportunity and you haven't seen it in a while and you are inclined to watch things that feel like how did this get made (laughs) then i recommend everyone check out the one of the last great filchy classic movies cat in the brain Oh Which, right, yeah. Oh hello, hello. It makes me very happy when I watch it, but I know people have told me it's just a bad film, and I'm like, ah, well, you're not wrong, but Filchi's dressed like Elmer Fudd. What's the one with John Savage? The, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, that same like doorway, do- mm, something. But that's the real crap one for me. Yeah, but the, the, it's, those like Cat in the Brain is surrounded by those. Yes, that's the problem. Yes. Like he basically he he had his um, right up till he did movies like uh, Anima and um, a even like a Murder Rock and stuff like that. He had he was still doing interesting stuff, and then his health started going down pretty bad. And he made a lot of right for TV movies and just like derivative shitty movies like that. You know, derivative of, of his own like making. And that's why I kind of love Cat in the Brain. Like Cat in the Brain, like no one else, unless I'm unless I don't know <laughs> like out there, no one else has really done a movie like it ever where the director directly puts some... The closest you could get to is something like... And I'm not comparing the two. <laughs> I just want to stress this. It's like maybe Roman Polanski in The Tenant. Um, right. Where, like, he himself is going crazy in that movie. He's playing a man going crazy. Um, that's essential what Filchie's doing, but Filchie's dressed like Elmer Fudd, and he's running around with an axe covered in red paint. And it's... <laughs> it's kind of glorious to watch. And then he just blatantly takes footage from... A previously shot movie, and he just intersperses it, uh, intersperses it in as events that are happening at the same time, simultaneous, and it's just it is a it is a bizarre, weird oddity of a movie. But to me, it is it once again shows that even even later, Dave Filci was still pushing the boat. They were still making things that, to me, I, there's so much I could talk like for hours about the camera work, the story direction, the weird scenes, actually how it, it makes more sense than it does on the surface. Um, I, I can't say that, for example, I get the same conversation uh, talking about like Argento's Phantom of the Opera, which, you know, is bad, you know, <laughs> like and came out about the same time. So I'd like, you're not going to get the same degree of, of kind of conversation on that one, it just feels like, well, our general saw this script and just decided he was going to make it for, because it may be interesting him, but he didn't know what he was doing with it, so he just did it anyway. Whereas Cat in the Brain, very much like, it feels like Filchi trying to parse out weird parts of his psyche on film. So it is, it is not a good movie. Uh, even if you're into Italian horror movies, it's a niche one. Even if you're a Filchi fan, I think it's a stretch, but... For those with the the fortitude and disposition, um, 
it's a bizarre and fast, infinitely fascinating watch. So that's my caveat with that one as well. I've came, I've came with baggage, is what I'm saying. There's a lot of grey in my recommends this week. Um, and that is, you know, a, unashamedly a, not a well-made movie, but at the same time, it's a weirdly well-made movie. So it's, I, it's I like the fact that... that it is. Yeah, but, you know, we contain multitudes, Duncan. And I like that you're kind of pointing that out yes. with your picks today, that not everything great is, is, uh, is you know, Im- impervious to criticism and not everything yes. terrible uh, is, is utter garbage. There are shades of gray, as uh, you eloquently sh- pointed out. Yeah, shades of gray. Now, this is where you come in with your bad, and uh, I- I'm interested to see um, if yours has any shades of gray or if it's I- just... Yes. The no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no brown note this week. Um, <laughs> the thing I've been hunting for for years, Duncan. The yeah, elusive brown note. Brown note. <laughs> <laughs> one day I'll find it. And one that when I do, I'll rule the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they will the call me of- Dr. Pooh. In um, the land of the brown note, the man with the plug up his butt is king. The man with the white undies is king. <laughs> uh, I oh my god! I don't know how to to weave a super villain searching for the brown note into anything, but I need I need that comic book. You'll find it. You'll find it. Yeah. Oh my god. Anyway, no, no, no. This is very much a uh, shades of gray kind of thing too because it's really not a terrible movie or anything but i got my problems duncan with uh one godzilla versus kong so i've not seen it yet it okay. is it's on the chart for us we're getting the wee one to watch it at the moment so we've just finished all the jurassic park movies and uh, we're now switching over to to do the kong godzilla movies so we watched godzilla last week which revisiting that i stand by it and i, I know there's a lot of people moaning that there's not a lot of godzilla in that movie i don't care when godzilla shows up he's fucking badass so suck it um, <laughs> like, i like that movie i like that movie it's it's, it's, it does a lot of good things for me and it gives me the money shot in that movie is fucking boner oh that hurr, right down oh, the gullet yeah oh, it's just, my and God. then the head he just told him that the, the fucking head that's been melted off the body and he just drops it and i'm like yep that's the money shot right there <laughs> you're not wrong it's one of the greatest things i've ever seen in a movie and yeah. i don't remember a whole lot about that that godzilla movie well but here's 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 my here is my point if that movie had been full of godzilla from start mm-hmm. to finish that shot would not have been as poignant because there would have been a lot of godzilla in that movie mm-hmm. so i think that's the genius of that movie plus it's the first fucking movie like I, the, people moan it like sorry bo i'm hijacking your conversation people moan about some weird fucking shit they will sit down and watch a batman movie where for the first hour he's not batman and then the last hour and a half, he's Batman, and they're fine right, with that. But, but it's not like in Godzilla, there's a giant lizard that everyone just knows as Kevin. And then yeah, at, but, at a certain point, he's like, ha ha, I've been Godzilla the whole time. But, like, like, but they, they, they set up that he's he's existed and he stayed out of sight. So that's yeah, enough yeah, yeah. for me. And there's plenty of shots in that movie of, like, there's a great... <laughs> It's a great bit where I'm like that. Yeah, like if I, if I was impatient, this might piss me off, but I kind of love it. Uh, where like he arrives at Hawaii, mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's just about to hit. Like it's about to set up something, and then it's like film footage on the news yeah. of the after effect. Right, so you didn't get the battle scene, but you can see what the damage is. And once again, to me, that's just adding. That's just adding to the the eventual you know battle but I, I can see why that might throw some people off so tonight we are doing the kong skull island which mm-hmm. i do like as well so i'm very much looking forward to sitting down to that you watched a movie which you were kind of really all about uh on the lead up to it so uh hit me with it you said it's good and bad oh may i now yes yes um but i've set you up <laughs> So, I'm very much like I'm like James Brown's helper that puts the coat on him. I put the coat on you, and now you can fling it off and stand back and go, "Ow!" Yeah, except every time I start seeing it, he comes back out anyway. I'm like, "Hey, get, <laughs> get the fuck off! I'm not ready for the cape. Get up off that! No, no, no! I'm get not up off of that thing! Stop talking about Godzilla. Uh, so, <laughs> so, anyway, Duncan, 
uh here here's the thing that I think I realized is um I'm not really crazy about this mythology that they're building at all mm-hmm. in in these in these movies and they've they've kind of peppered it through with all the monarch stuff and king of the monsters is really where they blew it all up and I I just don't care like all this oh there were titans that were living in the earth and then blah 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 and then here they are. I'm like, I don't need all that. Uh, I just, I just want, <laughs> I just want this big monkey to fight Godzilla. And how I long, want. How long is but, that movie? Uh, it's like two hours fifteen. I mean, I mean, like how that. long? How, how long is that movie without all that human shit? Well, okay. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is not only do you have uh, the kind of mythology that I don't care about. Mm -hmm. There is an entire subplot of this movie that it comes directly out of King of Monsters that Mm -hmm. does not matter at all and is occasionally painful to watch. And and it it's tough. It's a tough sit for those scenes. (laughs) And (laughs) but but Duncan, what and like I'm a big uh Adam Wingard, Simon Barrett fan i think they've done some amazing work yeah and i what i think he does right in in kind of uh it reminds me a bit of the guest Mm -hmm. is another good example of this of like look when these big monsters fight it's going to be ridiculous and it's Mm going to be colorful and it's going to be over the top and Mm -hmm. that stuff is awesome but everything around it it's like the 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 icing is delicious but the cake is all made of like old figs <laughs> i like figs <laughs> i know you like figs but this is old and it it tastes a little musty and Ooh. i think somebody like overdid the coriander Oh, uh, what it did i don't know Duncan, but it 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 fouls up all the icing it too it doesn't work more that's what i'm seeing it doesn't work so I think what I'm going to end up doing is licking all the icing off this terrible uh, over coriandered fig cake where mm-hmm. I can see myself going back. Like there's a battle scene in Tokyo that is incredible. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's visually stunning. It's really fun. Uh, you kind of, it, it has that old school feel where you kind of get the sense of what the monsters are saying without some stupid kid coming along. That's like, Hey, I I was telepathically communicating with Godzilla, and he he says this. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, where was Mothra? That's the other question I have: is where was Mothra in all this? That's was a bummer it, for me. I mean, bo, I don't want to. I don't want to be the dude. I don't want to be the dude. You're literally you are explain you are putting right out here the problem I have with every superhero movie post the Avengers. Yes, go on. So right, oh right. So uh, Iron Man's like stuck in a, a jam. Oh uh-huh. no! Where's all these supernatural, super powered buddies? Where are they? Oh, they're not. Oh, oh, they're all conveniently doing something. Well, isn't that convenient? And then the next movie comes out. Well, oh, the world's in trouble again. Where are all the? Oh, they're all busy. All oh, right. Well, that's 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 convenient. Uh, and then the next movie comes out, and I'm like, oh well, surely one of them's. Oh no, they're all busy again. All uh, right, but- that's. I will defend the decision because Mothra historically all through the films from the mm-hmm. like Showa era forward yep. has always been a lazy bastard. <laughs> Mothra has, you always have to talk Mothra into doing anything. Most of, mm-hmm. most of the Mothra, movies that Mothra appears in every time you see Mothra, it's just all the villagers on infant Island being like, Hey Mothra, would you mind saving the world? And Mothra's like, mm, probably not. <laughs> and Tuesday. It, it's Tuesday, isn't it? Yes, is a, a, it, yeah. A, a, until a finally, the twins have to come out and sing the special song. That's like Mosora. We really, really mean it this time. <laughs> and and then Mother is like, all right, like stubs out a cigarette. And what, Mothra sounds like Axl Rose before a Guns and Roses concert. Yeah, it's a real like, yeah, two, two, hours right. late, two hours late on stage. And, uh, totally. <laughs> Come yeah, on, come on, Axel. They're gonna t- they're gonna tear the place down, right? I prop right I here. Here is your Evian that you wanted. Your sang Pellegrino fizzy water, and and yes, I managed to find you beluga caviar somehow in South Africa. Don't ask me how I did it. 
I may have had to murder a man. Can you please go out there and sing <laughs> Welcome to the Jungle? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's my ultimately my problem with, with those movies is every time they start to get like really silly and goofy and, and, and kind of be the movies I, I sort of want them to be, um, they pull back and, and throw in uh you know like robert how much of that do you think that's how much of that do you think that's adam wingard and how much of that is a studio wanting more movies i i'm sure there's a template yeah like that script had to be approved by who knows how many people yeah so i'm sure that like this is definitely much like the marvel thing where it's like hey if you're a director you're coming into this universe and you can play with these toys but there are rules and some of those rules are going to be like, hey, you don't get just like script approval and stuff like that. Like James Gunn probably has that deal where he's just see. like, hey, I can write whatever I want. But I would imagine this is a a, a franchise. Yeah, but, like the ones, but that's those are the those are the better ones, are they not? The they, for the, sure they are. Yeah, personality on it. It's like like I'll tell you right now, you could you could you could pay me cold hard cash to sit down and watch those first two Thor movies and I ain't doing it, but you put on Ragnarok, I'm watching that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's sort of the lesson that Marvel learned over time was that I, I don't think they do it so much anymore mm. uh, where they, they, they do that tinkering thing, but I guarantee you that Thor dark world was, you know, there was a boardroom <laughs> of people trying to figure out how to make Thor happen. Uh, and it just turns out you need a weirdo to direct Thor movies and, yeah. and that works out. But um, yeah, I, like I said, I don't think this is a terrible movie, and there's really cool shit in it. And the Kong character is really good. He's not hooked on berries, which is a bummer, but you know, I don't get everything I want. <laughs> um, but and, but that's also kind of the problem is that for me, being an old school Godzilla fan, the fun comes from the stuff that's like, oh kong does love them berries and i mean he's like he's yeah. hooked on that shit and <laughs> that's how you get him to do stuff and mothra is a pain in the ass to wake up and get to do anything mm -hmm. and godzilla frankly doesn't give a shit about anything but getting away from everybody else and just doing godzilla shit yep. and like once you get out of like the original gajira and stuff like that where it's real super serious but as it gets goofy that kind of goofiness is what was really fun about it and and every time that you get that in this movie, then we have to cut away from it to go to something that doesn't matter, isn't entertaining, isn't even very well done, um, and and feels like not what I came to see. Uh, but that all said, I would still if somebody had enjoyed Skull Island like you did, I mm -hmm. would still say like, ah, eh, you know, you should see it because there's there's enough of that skull island kind of like let's just have these monsters fight vibe mm. um because there's a you know several rounds of godzilla and and like they don't skimp on that shit yeah. which is good of like hey we are going to have kong and godzilla fight two or three times and it, it they are gonna be barn burners mm -hmm. you know and anyway super that part of it's super fun the rest of it eh you know, but that's kind of always been the problem with Godzilla is that all the character shit doesn't matter and you just want to see the monsters fight. Um, <laughs> you know, ain't nothing new under the sun, as they say, Duncan. Um, I'll tell you what. What are you telling me? Let us uh, gather some questions. Oh, do we have questions? We do have some questions. I uh, love the question. But... So let's see. Uh, I think we've just got the one uh, today. That is I, unacceptable. I I called out a little earlier. So if you are uh, if you are in chat and would like to ask a question, feel free. As... If you do not want to receive the ire of Duncan, then what sounds like a goblet in Skyrim, the ire yeah. of Duncan. <laughs> it does. It. I must go on the mythical crest of Habujan Jar to find the ire of Duncan. It. <laughs> it makes you laugh hysterically yeah. and uh and and uh also say it's fucking brilliant <laughs> and question the historical inaccuracies of tv shows <laughs> uh yeah especially vikings yes um yes. okay so uh the ram man axes us um it's almost an unspoken oh, uh, let me let me take that again duncan 
Check this <laughs> out. You're gonna say unspoken, and then you couldn't pronounce it. I, yeah, then my tongues just swole up in my mouth. <laughs> it's like, almost a no, no, no. Yeah, I felt like Macaulay Culkin in My Girl for a second. Oh, too soon, too soon. Nah, it's, look, not Macaulay, the bees, bro. Not the bees. Macaulay Culkin is 58 years old. I think I think we're past. He's going to be in the new season of American Horror Story. Is he really? Yeah, and I will watch that shit because I think Macaulay Culkin is a fucking national. You ever listen to his podcast? I I have not. I I've seen yeah. the stuff he did on uh, Red Letter Media. I thought that was great. He's he's kind of amazing. Yeah. He's, he's like he's 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 very very strange, and I kind of love him for it. So yeah, that's that's the impression I got, and I'm totally fine with that. He he deserves it. Um, he's done all the drugs, bro. All the I, drugs. <laughs> I unlikely. would be shocked if he hadn't. <laughs> he was the party monster. He was the party. He is the party monster. Um. Anyway, back to the question. It's almost an unspoken rule that every director oh. eventually loses their touch with age. Uh, the examples he gives here are Carpenter, Craven, yep. Argento, etc. Uh, so we, we, he's focusing on the horror directors. Yes. Yes, right. Go. Um, however, how would you uh, explain guys like Mike Flanagan, who is now 42, also not that old, you son of a bitch, and yeah. Guillermo del Toro, who's 56... Uh, and they still seem sharp as ever. Um, uh, I think uh, just to just to throw in here, I think if you look at their collective bodies of work, they've just not made as many movies as the names you mentioned. Like Guillermo del Toro doesn't make a movie every two years. And yeah. For a while, there Carpenter was, Wes Craven certainly was, uh, Argento was for sure um, for a long period of time. So I, I think it also speaks to, to be fair. Guillermo del Toro has hit his stride. But if we, we'll go through the names he's mentioned on his list and then we'll come back to the ones he's mentioned. So the first name he mentioned was Carpenter. Uh -huh. Look at Carpenter's run. Like, I mean, if, if we're going to talk about bad movies here, right, Carpenter really only made three bad movies in his career. A career that spans, what, over 15 movies. I all right. Let's hold right, on. We're gonna have to let's fact check. Yes, we we yeah, are fact, fact checking real time. John so, Carpenter. Yep. Go last, for the start. Okay. So Go first of all, let's let's point out he is currently seventy three <laughs> years of age, and he plays Xbox and loves it. It's and not, I love the fact that he's doing that. Not the point. Uh. <laughs> so. He doesn't care. He's like that. They didn't have these computer games when I was in the seventies. Hence, why I made all these movies. Now they do. So fuck your movies. Um, also, by the way, uh, credited as uh, a writer for a handful of episodes recently, uh, just for various shows. Oh, Slasher. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Season four of Slasher, written by, starring David Cronenberg. Yeah, written, written by, by John, John Carpenter. Carpenter. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so but the last. Uh, official movie he did was the was war, the war, right? Yeah, which which was he written... did when he was sixty-two. Yeah, and, and when did when did that come out? Two thousand ten. Yeah, two thousand ten. Right. Uh -huh. So like, right. So it's the last movie he did. Um, if we jump back before the war, the movie before the war was what Ghost of Mars. Go Ghost of Mars, which was nine years before that, when he would have been fifty-three. Yeah. Which I want, like I say, like I think I still think Time Will Out in that movie. That is a big dumb goofy movie, and I kind of, I kind of like it. I, I do. I don't think it's once again. It's the issue is that it's put against Carpenter's back catalog. I think if you remove it from Carpenter's back catalog, there are a ton of directors right now trying to make that movie, <laughs> like essentially trying to make a movie as good as Ghost of Mars and can't do it. Uh, there's tons of indie filmmakers out there trying to do the old kind of siege sort of thing uh only look at the void for example mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, yeah i'd probably rather watch ghost of mars than the void i'm with you on that 100 uh, um, percent. that's why no one will ever love his bow uh before that he did um so vampires before that vampires was before that then escape from la then village of the damned which is kind of a bad run none of those are particularly great uh, i like vampires it's all right and then uh in the mouth of madness in 94 is kind of the which last is, stone cold classic which i would argue is up there amongst his best so yeah and so th that would have put him at 46 when he made his last right so classic. 40, 46 is when he made his last classic how many movies did he make before that uh right well i mean that's where you get into <laughs> this is just stupid 
Um, yeah. Because right, before right. that sit, is sit down and drink this in, ladies and gents. Right. Because before that you have uh, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which is yep. fun. They Live, Prince of Darkness, yep. Big Trouble in Little China, yep. Starman, Christine, yep. The Thing, yep. Escape yep. from New York, The yep. Fog, yep. that Elvis movie, Someone's yep. Watching Me, Halloween, yep. Assault on Precinct 13, yep. and Dark Star. Right. Fucking so. mic drop, right? Like, uh, give the man his couple of movies which weren't incredible, but they're not bad. And, like, and War is not a bad movie. It's just not a great movie. And it's really about 20 years where he made, you know, some of the, some of the most right. about important. a movie every other year for 20 years. And, yeah. and, and those movies incredible. you could argue are some of the most important movies ever released in our genre. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. But, but I think the point being like, Hey, after he hit that 46 year old Mark, but eh. I, don't think that, I don't think that counts because Craven was Craven was older than 46 when he made scream. All right. So to that end, let's so uh let's, let's turn to Wes Craven who yes. doesn't have the same lofty career actually there's a lot of bad Wes Craven movies earlier in his career like right like, Hills of Eyes 2 is not a good movie um so he was let's see so uh, he was the oldest yeah so he was born in 39 yep um so he did uh da, 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 da. his big stuff was like i mean he was in his 30s he had one when every, he started he had, he had one, yeah one in every decade so well like, like last house decade. on the left he yep. was 33 right <laughs> so i mean he started late yes um hills have eyes he's 38 yeah which so how old is he when he does nightmare on elm street he is, is what 85 45 so. Forty right, for so he's just hitting he's Flanagan's age when he makes Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. Uh when he makes Scream, he Which is, is six. fifty seven. Right. And, and you could argue Scream is his last great movie. Right, but that's still he's almost are, sixty yeah. at that point. That's a, Yeah, that's the rest are just scream movies. Run. Yeah, so like, there screen movies and some movies which are just eh. so what I'm saying is like, but he's not as consistent as Carpenter. Because if you look at the movies in between oh, no, no, Hills no. Have Eyes and Nightmare on Elm Street, it's things like Swamp Thing, Deadly Blessings, um, fucking uh, Hills Have Eyes 2, uh, just some not very good movies. And then in between Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream, you've got Serpent and the Rainbow, which, yes, is a great movie, but Shocker's kind of cheesy. Uh, Vampire in Brooklyn is not a good movie. There's that Nightmare on yeah. Elm Street movie where it comes back, which is interesting. It doesn't. It's not a great movie, but it's an interesting concept. And the people under the stairs, which I mean, I love unabashedly, but I would understand if someone didn't. So what I'm saying once again, like, and then his last one was Argento. So Argento yeah. is to me Argento is the one that that drops off quickest out the wall. You want to? Would we? Would we say Phenomena is the last great one? I mean, that's removing opera from the list. I love opera. I think opera is. Okay. I think opera is grossly misunderstood. I, I, after opera, opera is realistically his last great movie, and then yeah. you have a few spattered after and that. that. Like I like his segment in uh, Two Evil Eyes. Sure, I think Sleepless is a great movie. Stendhal Syndrome is an interesting, albeit uncomfortable, movie to watch. Um, and yeah, I have a soft spot for uh, Mother of Tears, but I know it's not a good movie. Right. So, but um, I mean, his run is kind of seventy-five to eighty-seven, which is Deep Red, Suspiria, well, even, Inferno, Tenebrae, that. Phenomena. I think, well, his run is opera. seventy. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. The Crystal Plumage. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, right. Cat and Ingtails. Right, Four Fives and Grey Velvets. Maybe the lesser one, but I really like it. Deep Red. Um, we well, made a comedy in between, but won't discuss that. Deep Red, Suspiria. Uh, Inferno, Tenebrae, <laughs> like, uh, and Phenomena, and then Opera. I mean, like, and there's a couple of years in between all of them. How old was he when he made Opera? Uh, he was 47 when he made Opera. Right, so he's Flanagan's age then, but with, he'd, he'd, at that point, he'd already made Suspiria mm -hmm. and Deep Red. Uh, you know, I mean, so I, I think it's, I think, and it's, un, it's not necessarily fair, I think, to even compare Flanagan and in on this one because I think Flanagan is a director who doesn't quite fit the mold of most of most modern horror directors and that I think he's been afforded the opportunity to to really settle down and do some of that King product 
um, but also like expanding to to doing specific Netflix stuff, which has allowed them to do, you know, like Gerald's Game is not a perfect movie by any stretch of imagination. It's a good movie. Um, its biggest issue is that it adheres too close to the book at the end. Um, and Doctor Sleep, you know, there's studio interference here. So it's, it's a great movie, but there's like it should, it should just be his original vision for that sure. That director's cut is it's fucking so great. So good, man. That is, I can it's see one why of my the favorite studio, King adaptations. Yeah, I can see why the studio didn't put it out though, because they're like that. Yeah, audiences are not going to sit through this, and uh, they're not wrong. Modern audiences don't want to sit for a, a three-hour movie. Uh, that's that's yeah. not that's not incorrect. There's, there's <laughs> data on that one. They spent a lot of money on it, but Flanagan. I mean, look at his movies and look at which ones are actually critically held up as great movies. Oculus wasn't, even though we love it. Mm. Hush wasn't, even though that we love it. Um, so they're not critically great movies; they're audience great movies. Whereas the flip side, um, well, maybe there's a bit of Carpenter in that then as well, because Carpenter's a lot of Carpenter's movies have become I think, critically fashionable. So I think Flanagan and Carpenter have actually very strangely similar careers yeah and and i think that i i think flanagan will eventually be seen in in a similar light yeah and the, um, the last one the last one i would mention is you mentioned guillermo del toro yeah and guillermo del toro's had a couple of stinkers <laughs> and also just doesn't make that much stuff his yeah, output's he, he, real real thin but he does me, a lot of production stuff he's behind the push for a lot of filmmakers he's he's invested back in the industry yes, without absolutely. him you wouldn't have movies like the orphanage or a lot of alex de iglesias stuff or you know like um he's he's done a lot of that stuff behind the scenes which I kind of love about him, but you could also argue the movies that work best for Del Toro are his own movies. Absolutely. The ones, and those are very, he's a different kettle of fish yeah, in yeah. that is, he's trying to work in a Hollywood system trying, trying to produce Spanish language movies. And Argento didn't have to ever worry about that because yeah. there was a massive mechanism behind him in Italy that would allow him to make whatever the fuck he wanted. So. Yeah. Del Toro has successfully avoided the Tim Burton fate, which <laughs> is to become a parody of himself. And, yeah, and, and so let me, a couple of things from chat that I, I think are, are really insightful. Bring in. Um, first of all, thanks for everybody uh, hanging out with us today. Dave, uh, howdy. Uh, but um, Lori says, uh, I don't think that these directors lose their touch uh, so much as they get nostalgic for the movies that they love and yep. start remaking like stuff from when they were a kid that feels sort of out of touch and... Well, and, I, think and it's, I think it's the, just in general, filmmakers, th those sort of filmmakers are like a lot of John Carpenter's in his movies, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of John Carpenter's. So that kind of, you know, not being, uh, not wanting to play by the rules, not wanting to work within the system is all ingrained in these movies. But there's also a worldview which essentially is no longer there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that's, I, I don't ever think, I, it's like, it's like any great artist. What inspires you has he has he time frame, yeah, of right. interest. And then when it loses that interest, De Palma is the greatest example of that. De Palma is a guy who was never never seen as being like the the guy. Critics, a lot of critics loved him. A lot of critics fucking hate him. Um, and yet he managed to have a run of movies which were nothing short of extraordinary right up to right up until he's, he's his biggest his highest grossing movie and you put this into the context of someone that did fucking scarface and the untouchables like and all the other shit that i love his biggest grossing movie is mission impossible from 95 which i'd really? argue yeah is, is maybe his laziest is his highest grossing movie yeah, yeah um, i mean it's very much a like hey i'm gonna do a Tom hollywood Cruise, movie as, as Tom Cruise that's in it, so yeah. uh, that's why. It's, but it's, that's his highest grossing movie. Hmm. Um, yeah, that makes he, sense. He's cataloging movies. You know, like, really, really interesting. But he's a guy who, as soon as Snake Eyes flopped, um, he was like, yep, <laughs> no one's going to finance my movies now. My voice isn't relevant here. And he's done a ton of French and European finance movies, mm. and all of them are garbage. Yeah. <laughs> like, but he said it himself, if you ever want a good, a good um, window into a director's mind of someone who is kind of losing their touch, so to speak. I, I go back to this all the time. The De Palma documentary, which is just purely called De Palma, is mandatory viewing for anyone interested in film because it is, they have him in a room 
and he just talks about his career and he talks about all the Hitchcock shit that he got landed with, you know, just ripping off Hitchcock and things like that. Hitchcock was, maybe still is, one of the most important filmmakers of all time who kind of patented the style of thriller that I loved. So yeah, if you're saying, did I rip off Hitchcock? I told stories just like him. So if that makes me a rip off artist, I'm a rip off artist. But you know, like he's, he's, he's blunt on everything, but he says it himself. He says, if you look at Hitchcock in his 50s, look at where his career went. Right. He, yeah. He ended up doing like, you know, uh, what frenzy and rope and yeah, a family is plot. The, yeah. Frenzy is the one I always come back to. Frenzy is a nasty fucking film. Yeah. Or wouldn't that, that be R rated? Are they only R rated Hitchcock yeah, film? And yeah. that's, that's why it is a nasty piece of work by a guy who was, he made that in his seventies. I think that's his, I think frenzy might be his last movie. And it's, it is surprisingly dark. Mm. for for a director that had already made movies like psycho <laughs> like, I mean, it's just yeah like, which isn't terribly sunny yeah <laughs> yeah like it's it, i think i think but the palma sums it up really really well that there's a point where filmmakers should stop making films but as artists and very much like fighters there's always there, that, there's a prime. Maybe there's, there's all there's always one left in me maybe right. this you know, i might have one more story to tell um to and that Flanagan end, will go the same way, uh, and Del Toro might never go that way. I don't know. Um, Alan McPherson in in the chat has Hi, the Alan. best example of this, which is George Miller, who oh God, at yeah. the age of one hundred and twelve, <laughs> you bad man, was bad was man. like, hey, what if I'm making the best Mad Max movie of my career, <laughs> and. In a, a cross between an Australian man and a chimney sweep. I'm not entirely sure where he's from, but I like it. Yeah, well, you know, that's how he talks. By Jove, Mary Poppins, here comes fucking Mad Max. Do you want a tangerine, Mary Poppins? <laughs> um, that That's the word for me, tangerine. It's uh, also how you get into the Kiwi accent. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, George Miller's a, a great, uh example of maybe this George Miller actually made though. I what else does he have to do? What does he have to prove to you, Duncan, after after being a million years old and making Fury Road, which is one of the great yeah, action yeah. films of all time. It does, it, it's up there amongst one of the greatest action movies of all time. But what was his movie before like, how long know, was that? Babe too. Because that, that movie was that movie was fucking a decade in the making, so... Yeah, I'm, well, but that's the thing, is George Miller is not also a very non-prolific uh, filmmaker. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when he comes out with a movie, I, I would argue... Let's look at the, at the list real quick, but... So, he's got Fury Road. Before that, he did those Happy Feet movies and which oh, are so not fucking dead oh that's right which are not bad movies they're, they're you know yeah but they're, they're animated though oh yeah and before that he did babe pig in the city which is a super weird movie <laughs> um then he did lorenzo's oil which is a good movie yeah what year was that though uh 92 Right, and so, then Witches of Eastwick was five years before I that, which is an amazing of, movie. I love the Witches of Eastwick. Then a so. couple of years before that is Beyond Thunderdome, which is yeah, eh, weakest of the Mad Max movies probably, but still really good. Has Tina Turner though and a bitch in soundtrack, and and like there's plenty of good about it. Um, yep. Road Warrior eighty one, Mad Max seventy nine. Uh, so yeah, so he started at the age of. 34 was Mad Max. Fuck's sake. So, you know, uh, by the time he's... 112. Yeah, I mean, he. well, he, he at this point, he's uh, he's 76 he, right now. I, I, was, I, thought, I thought he must be tipping his 80s. Um, yeah, he's he's getting real close, but he's... And he's got know, another one coming out? He's so. got He's got a movie in pre-production... And one in post. Oh shit! Uh, one the post? one in post is called Three Thousand Years of Longing," which is Idris Elba, Tilda Swinton. Oh, boom, boom! There, Listen you have to. Me in. Let me just give you the 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 synopsis of this. Well, I, let's the, this I'm just saying you're very happy. I can't see what's written on the screen, but the word monkey might be in there. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> a scholar content with life encounters a djinn 
who oh, offers her three wishes in exchange for his freedom. Their conversation in a hotel room in Istanbul leads to consequences neither would have expected. It sounds like a happy, happy Hellraiser. <laughs> I yeah, that sounds amazing. Just Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton acting across from one another sounds oh, yeah, great to me. That's, that's some good casting as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that's his his next movie, and then he's in pre production for Furiosa on for yeah. Furiosa, yeah. which is yeah. uh, Anya Taylor Joy as that's as Furiosa. Yeah, that's a great bit of casting. Right, like <laughs> so. Yeah, to that point. Uh, first of all, Dave, uh, my British accent is amazing. It is not dreadful. You just haven't been to the parts of England what, where the, people no, speak this Bo's, way. Bose, like, you, yeah. Well, here's the point. Bose English accent there was supposed to be an Australian accent. You so, son of a bitch. Um, I think that sums up everything. Bose English accent was supposed to be Australian. So. It's it is it's something I work on. My dialogue coach says that I'm the best in his class. Have you spoken to the witch recently? Because I'm fairly sure he's going to tell you that you're talking shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, the point, Duncan, yes. is that I think I think George Miller is kind of the exception that proves the rule, which is it's rare for a director to be, you know, outside of like a Scorsese or somebody like that, one of the greats. Well, I was going to say Scorsese is a good example. I would argue, even though he's off the wall and does a ton of documentaries, Werner Herzog. Uh, yeah, I mean, Werner Herzog can do no wrong. He... So, you know what I mean? There are directors out there. I think in the horror genre, I think when you stay exclusively within the horror genre, um, financing becomes very difficult to... Georgie Romero is the one I always come back to. Georgie mm. Romero could only really towards the from for the last 20 years of his career could only really get green lit movies that were about zombies yeah and, of the yeah. dead had to be in the title or it was yeah. not going to get made yeah. and i mean that's a criminal fucking shame because he's a great director um but that's just how that's just how financing works you know they can't they won't give you it's why john carpenter isn't making movies anymore he only made the ward because and he, and this is in his words, it was in twenty minutes drive from his house. He would not have made it otherwise. And I, once again, I will, I will just say, the ward is not a bad horror movie. It's just not a great Carpenter movie. Eh, it, I don't. I think it's a pretty it's, dull and flat horror movie. It's regardless. not a bad horror movie. It's not a bad horror movie. The acting is is good in that movie. It's just it feels like a very predictable plot, which yeah. is not on Carpenter. That's on the script. So he directs that movie well. You can, listen, if you are given a tangerine, you can't turn it into a satsuma. And All right. Well, look, we don't make up words on this show, Duncan, so we're going to move satsuma on. Satsuma isn't a word uh, that's been made up here. That's a real thing. Um, Agree to disagree. So <laughs> the... <laughs> the ne- <laughs> when in Rome. When, when in Rome, Rome. yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm not, not exactly sure what that means. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we have come, ladies and jelly spoons, to the even, the finale. You didn't even change your ex- your expression. Didn't change your anything. You came right there. What? Uh, all right. You're one so, of those ones, aren't you? You're one of those silent comers. <laughs> it's just a slight raise of the eyebrow, and Bo's popped. You know, I've never had children, Duncan, <laughs> but this is the what I'm feeling right now. Is what I I am sure that uh, a lot of you fathers been, feel. When, have you ever been a substitute teacher? I school? have, as a matter of fact. Yes. That's li- this is the experience right now, isn't it? Yeah, I I yeah I was a substitute teacher for a little bit when I was yeah. uh, going to school to be a teacher mm-hmm. uh, when I was in college, and that was before I, re- I you know I started actually doing the in classroom you- stuff <laughs> where I was like, oh, I don't, <laughs> I don't like these children at all. Um, <laughs> it's not just these children; it's all children. Yeah, yeah. It turns, yeah, it turns out uh, when, when it comes to anyone under the age of, I don't know, twenty-seven, mm. I just don't give a shit about them. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't really have a good story about substitute teaching other than the fact that I did it. Although, here's here's one thing: uh, I I had to do a substitute teaching stint one time in a uh, a special needs classroom. Mm-hmm. And there was this kid, and it's just something that you're not used to, right? Where there's this kid who's like actually strapped down to oh, this this kind of cot as they're teaching. 
and I was like, oh my god, that like this seems like it, it ought to be against the law or something. Is this right? And they were like, we can't. You don't understand. We cannot. <laughs> we cannot let loose those those bonds because if we do, and this happened last week, at some point in the class, this kid will jump up run out that door over there and we've got to go catch him <laughs> and this will happen at least three times a day so they had to get like all the like the parental permissions and all this stuff of like hey we got to tie your kid down for a little bit every day <laughs> and yeah sounds that's like the, the fucking like, it sounds like Bo's like the guy at the start of 20 days later releasing the monkey <laughs> I mean, look, I did not I did not interfere in this situation. I, th again, this is another point where I'm like, I don't know if I want to be doing this. I don't know if I want to <laughs> strap down want, children as a rule. I don't want to be running after anyone. Yeah. I want to teach them English. I, right. <laughs> all I, yeah, I just want to teach them a love of literature. It turns out <laughs> kids don't give a shit about that. No. Nope. Um, so anyway, uh, we have come to the end of season one with, with Slasher. Yes. Episode eight here is called Soon Your Own Eyes Will See. How bad this story is. <laughs> Duncan, <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you about this. So let's jump oh, into this. Yeah, some of this is, we were talking just before we hit record, but some of this, I had to stop this last night for laughing. I actually it thought is. I was going to, I thought I was going to wet myself. So um, I'm glad that I, uh, I'm glad that we got through it. And um, it is just when you thought Slasher was some of the worst you'd ever seen, it found a new level. <laughs> this is pure nonsense. Um, yeah, like, you mean right from the start, Bo? Yes, yeah. yes, it is. <laughs> well, so, it's on everything we know about everything. We begin in the year 1996, <laughs> where, where a young Cam is walking around his house like fucking Michael Myers. We get the I'm whole just, like, yep. POV shot and everything. Heavy breathing. Heavy yeah, breathing. It is, yeah, it is absolutely ripping off Halloween. Yes. And he creeps into his parents' bedroom. Mm -hmm. And they're both asleep. And then the mother wakes up. And it's Who like, is arguably the worst mother in TV history. Well, you know, Sybil was on television, Doctor. <laughs> um, <laughs> just pointing it out. You know, that's a pretty high bar. <laughs> Don't know. This woman, who is, by the way, a brand new character that we've, uh, that has never been mentioned before, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I really love is how this show is, is quick to recontextualize everything whenever it feels like yeah, it remember, needs to. Remember when the priest had a wife? I bet you were wondering who Cam's mother was. And I was like, actually, I wasn't at any point. <laughs> like, Right. Well, you know, uh, I, she's got the rarest action figure. <laughs> those things go you find a cam's mom in box mint Dude, like she, she's the it's... she's the card that you want to trade for if you're playing top trumps for slasher yeah oh you she's can... the one that's unlimited abilities on everything so <laughs> you can you can put your kid through college a hundred a um, hundred and all those points like a uh, sass a hundred you know <laughs> like child abuse a hundred um Lack but, of sleep, one and insomnia, insomnia rage, one hundred. Um, I dude, want that card. She, she is not pleased at all to be awakened by her child, especially because he's in a pig mask. Well, yeah, which we never explain, but that's okay. And doesn't come up again, so don't worry no. about it. No. Uh, but she gets out of bed and she's just like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> and he's like, "Huh? What? I was." I, I was sleeping. How'd I, how'd I get in here? No, and, how am I wearing the mask? <laughs> right. How? Where did this pig mask come from? Why did you buy this for me? Yeah, why? I like, I'm like, look at me. I'm a child. I couldn't have afforded this with my pocket money. You bought this for me. Right. Why would you do this? Why Why did you make me go as a pig boy for Halloween? And why would you leave it in my room when you know I sleepwalk? Why wouldn't you hide it somewhere? Like in the loft or something? <laughs> why did you make my, my teachers change my name in the rule books from yeah. Cam to Dirty Pig Boy? Yeah, and also, why wouldn't you just make sure I went to the toilet before I went to bed so I wouldn't have made the accident you're about to get really unhappy about? Oh, right. So she starts yelling at this kid who then yeah. pisses himself, and she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> you pissed yourself. And then. <laughs> she's she tells him, I'm going to get you a diaper and I'm going to make all the kids in your school. Look at you in your diaper, you stupid baby. Yeah. And this poor kid just loses his shit. Well, and this, gives... this poor kid, this poor kid just woke up. Yes. <laughs> but still, still right, woke crazy, up to his yeah. mother screaming at him <laughs> and humiliating him. He's like, no one's more surprised than the kid here who's woke up in piss soaked pajamas and wearing a pig mask, having his mother scream at him about wearing a diaper. Well, but it's not it's not so nice as all that, Duncan, because as soon as he shoves her down the stairs and well, he she push, he pushes her down the stairs. Yeah. And, and she, you know, clumpity clumpity clumps down snaps. to the bottom and then yeah, she's dead. The real kind of death becomes her moment, you know. Yeah. I mean? Except she doesn't come back. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and Cam gives this like creepy Damien smile. Like, mm, now now we see who has pissed themselves, mother. <laughs> How do you enjoy the release of death? <laughs> father um, you will become a priest i am off to my bed <laughs> father clean this up <laughs> because it, like the dad's like cam what have you done cam my wife no <laughs> yeah and then cut to credits and yeah i'm like oh so he was so there's yes. been a killer in the temple mm -hmm. he's been going around murdering people mm -hmm. and at no point did the reverend which by the way you might be thinking to yourself maybe he had a like maybe he had a suspicion no no no. the next scene will prove that he didn't have a suspicion at no point did the priest think wait one second my kid used to wear masks and killed my wife he had a troubled childhood maybe it was him <laughs> it's it's so ridiculous it's so baffling is what i thought when i saw it. i was like this is just no <laughs> yeah also also Woman clearly has been pushed down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Any police investigation would come to the bottom of that. Likely the father would do time because it would look like he did it, not the son. Um, so our reverend would be sharing a jail cell with, <laughs> with a resident serial killer. I just, it's all, to, I, I mean, the police ineptitude will follow on to the end of the show where what should have happened is an all like gun, <laughs> like a fucking, a fire fight! Um, which doesn't happen. <laughs> But we'll, we'll, we'll get, yeah, but so this is, so we're now, remember when Cam put away that box at the end and reveal, revealed him as a killer? Now we need to explain why he's a killer in the most generic eye rolling sequence of, well, he hurt animals and he, you know, he killed his mother and he slept walked, he peed the bed and he wore masks. And he, he started fires and his but, name was yep. originally Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, literally, as, as the box, as the lazy box ticking exercise, this might as well have been, it kind of feels like a slightly worse written introduction to Rob Zombie's Michael Myers. What, like, what if you Googled, how do, how do you become a serial killer? Yeah. And you just cut and pasted that into the script. And it's just, and it's all in this one scene though. Yeah. So it's not like we get a collection of things that lead up to it. Just one night. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, not oh, like, yeah, Pepper throughout the season, it's like, oh, Cam really doesn't like dogs. Oh, Cam, you know, Cam likes to hide his rubber underwear or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like you do. Like the, but there's a whole there's a kind of whole series of things where I thought, very much like yourself, they could have had things, like, they could have done the old usual suspects thing where we got a reveal at the end of this episode and when you actually go back and think about some of Cam's interactions, they don't quite marry up. Um, which, you know, would have made more sense. Mm -hmm. The problem in this one is, Bo, the biggest problem in this, <laughs> the biggest problem is... Yeah, tell me what the problem with the finale is, Duncan. Episode number one, we were like, we think Cam might be the killer, right? So by this point, I don't need to know, I don't need to know seven hours into this TV show what the five-second introduction to what made him a killer actually is. Yeah, it, in fairness, we clock this early. early. Yeah, early. Uh, so, but so, even then, though, like even if you, even if this was like in the previous episodes, you were like, oh, "It's Cam." <laughs> yeah, my eyes deceive me. Like the next episode, that that small introduction doesn't do anything really except say, "Well, he was a troubled kid," right. which 
I'm going to guess it anyway because he's a fucking murderer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He's and, yeah people it, in really vicious ways. In a really bad seed kind of way. Like he did that on purpose yeah. and was happy about killing his own mother. And, Who, and by so. He wasn't a nice person and not that I'm judging, but. Right. But, you know, let, let's argue over who deserves to be shoved downstairs by their evil bad sea child that he, she, she probably evil? created he, but you know yeah she 100 percent created but i'm nature over nurture here um so we cut to cam yeah as an adult who is uh carving a jack-o'-lantern by just stabbing it in the face <laughs> it's like because halloween bo, um <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, it would because yeah, of course we've got to end on Halloween, which is also hoi to toy, it's me birthday. <laughs> Megora. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Cam uh in this scene is like Sarah, I say what you will about the executioner and all. <laughs> I love this cuz there's a lot of side eye in the way you say that. Yeah. Maybe this guy wasn't all that bad because the time you know it had a lot of dark secrets which were exposed from some bad people who i mean just aren't around anymore i mean i'm not saying what he did was right but maybe the end result was a positive For, yeah and sarah <laughs> is like hoi to toy you know maybe you're right cam and I, I was like what no in the previous episode you you slit your hand and made a blood oath to bring the head of the yeah. killer in and she does at the end of it, she's like that, you know, things are just starting. Wait, why do they get a load of me? You know what I mean? I'm like, 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 I'm like, I can't wait to see this vengeance that she will rot upon this town. Uh -huh. And then the next episode, she's like, well, maybe the executioner wasn't a bad guy. Don't agree with the killings, mind you. But he did have a point, Bo. You know, I've been thinking about it. Maybe he wasn't so bad. Uh, so... It's anyway. three months on as well, by the way. So yeah. once again, time time is a flat circle in this show. Uh, it is revealed that this is three months on from when June died, which yeah. was like one day before the the girl was found in the basement, and two days before um, Tom Swan dived onto a bleed. Um, I'm surprised. So yeah. I'm surprised she doesn't have a kid. Yeah, <laughs> she's a young mother, but. Anyway, so then Reverend Weirdo walks in on them yeah. as they're, you know, kind of getting a little chummy. And he's just like, wait a second. What the fuck's going on here? Yeah. And Cav is like, hey, it's her birthday tomorrow. So, you know, along with Halloween, we're going to have a good time. And, uh, you know, of course, Reverend Daddy here, who was just recently <laughs> accused. Oh, it sounds like the worst part of ever. <laughs> Reverend Daddy. <laughs> oh on your knees it's time for absolution from reverend daddy and his altar of enemas um, oh wow <laughs> it's not where i thought we were going but okay <laughs> yeah I'd, i've been in lockdown too long though <laughs> and also obsessed with your ass a little more than i would have expected <laughs> so it's the logical place to go after a, a year in the house <laughs> Yeah, you just reach the point where you're like, "Well, I've looked at everything else in the house. It's time to get <laughs> time to get real comfortable with my asshole." <laughs> it's a, it's time I became friends with part of me that I've never really, you know, shook hands with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of us isn't going to be happy about the next twenty four hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but after that, we're both going to be especially happy. Um. I don't know what that means. Anyway. <laughs> so, Re yeah, but Reverend Daddy is like, happy birthday, Sarah. He is like still giving her shit. Well, which of course. I kinda, which, I, which I kind of love. He's still giving her, because I th in his head, does he still think she is behind it? Because this is like, this is what I was kind of thinking like when I was watching this year. Because I was like, it, the previous episode, what you asked me at the end of the last episode, what I thought was going to be the big revelation in this one and my big theory was uh was one that um uh dylan was going to come back and save the day which we're going to get mm -hmm. to that but the second thing was that the father was in on it <clears throat> right and yeah well, yes and i i thought that was a real good call but not the case no because once again why <laughs> why would they do that why would they why 
would they give us that? Well, he's been feeding his son religious sermons, which his son is taking. You know, that we're not going to do that. So I think when he comes in and does this, he still blames Sarah. I think Sarah's behind it. Or um, yeah, just as just a whole, It doesn't. It doesn't make any fucking sense at all because it is very much like a oh look who's here. It's Sarah. Right. Ooh, whoop de do, Sarah. That's right. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, it's your birthday. Is it have another year in this planet? Did you? Oh, that's great. You know, it's, it's so sarcastic for a man who's literally preaching turn the other cheek. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very, he, he likes to hold a grudge. Um, yeah, he's Sarah, well, he's an Irish priest. Sarah has to go. Um, and thank God because this scene is excruciating. Because Cam, I don't know what it's about. Like in this last episode, he does have the characteristics of a trap child. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's kind of, and we're going to cut the pumpkin and go trick or treating. And mm-hmm. you know, like, and all this, and I'm like, mm, I don't like this. You know what I mean? I like when he, when Cam, you know, fucks off that uh, River Daddy is just like, oh my poor crazy ass son because well, like, this is because the thing is like the like you <laughs> so like we we get a scene coming up which forces him to think maybe my son is the killer and mm. it like he's like he's trapped like he's locked away all these memories in a box not to be remembered uh but like cena has to go at the shop well man the speaking of plot lines that go nowhere why did why was this even a thing in the show out with this is why she's moved back to the town so, yeah so she, her her gallery her art gallery is now super popular among goth kids yeah and one presumes because of her association with all the executioner murders and so forth yeah but Oh my god, this is so stupid, Duncan. So it opens with <laughs> her it, having this it. conversation <laughs> with this like lesbian goth couple. Yep. And the one of the lesbian goth girls is like, uh, so can I have any painting that you've painted yourself? Yeah, money is no object. Right. And her girlfriend is like, Money's no object. What are you doing? And she says, Duncan. Yep. This is not made up, by the way, ladies I, and gents. This is how Slasher perceives goth lesbians. Yes. She says, you know I get six figures drinking blood on the internet. I get what? six figures drinking blood on the internet. It's almost as preposterous as in the previous episode. Whatever that reporter who just disappeared. She didn't come back for the last episode. She no, Lee Sanfellows is gone. She's fucking gone. She's she, she gets it. one line in this episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, remember when Lisa Ivelles was like, uh, "My, you know, my one hundred thousand square foot, like the whole state of New York is mine." Yeah. Um, I, I own in, Central Park. She lives like it was upper upper West Manhattan or something. Where yeah. she said she owned like it was like five hundred a thousand square foot of property or whatever and I, I was like that time going who, who is she oprah well apparently in this world you can just make money doing anything because you can get six figures for drinking blood which isn't the issue here the issue is that this might be a riff in the relationship because it's not the blood of our lesbian lover i <laughs> i get it from other people i thought we've had this conversation before and i'm like what are we doing here other than a really shallow you know, projection of what you think. By the way, incidentally, a lot of people that will be watching this show uh, are horror fans who have yeah. to like goth music. All you're doing is shitting on your fandom. Um, right, yeah, it doesn't like the people that would be watching this show. I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. understand it. It's like a needless dig. Um, but then, Bo, then mm-hmm. Bo, our favourite character, who's two grand, uh, two million in debt, and we've not come back to that. Who's doesn't get mentioned Robert, again. Our boyfriend was murdered. He seems to have plenty of money for some day drinking. You know what I'm saying? Uh huh. Day drinking. Well, when uh, you're when you're that much in debt, it's like not being in debt at all. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like if your trousers are wet because you've had to walk through a stream, you might as well piss them and open them to take a piss. Right. You know what I mean? well, what's the point? Like, hey, thirty bucks one way or the other ain't gonna make a, a dent yeah. in this. So, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. So, and and Robin even makes fun of these goth kids when he comes in. Yep. And he's like, what's all these Cure fans doing here? Wink, wink. And you're like, hey, Dick. What, what are all these slasher watchers doing in here? How about it's just not- paying my bills? You know, let's just yeah. not look a gift horse in the mouth. And and he's like, 
Look, uh, I've been sitting on, uh, you know, my depression for a while ever since my, you know, husband frothed at the mouth and died on the floor of our home and all. So uh, I decided that I was going to throw a Halloween party in his honor. Yeah, because he loved throwing those parties that apparently were one of the reasons we ended up in so much debt. Yeah, yeah. It turns out it, it, parties are expensive when you mm -hmm. throw them the way that we did with all the cocaine and all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah's like, look, I appreciate you asking me, but I believe I'm just going to walk the beat and then go home <laughs> and eat some candy. They're going to send one of my guys to the hospital. I'm going to send one of theirs to the morgue. What are you doing, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the root, the root of the impression comes out, <laughs> and then uh, Robin is like, you know, I'm gonna get you to come to that party whether you like it or not. And he's like, all right, yeah, just hit, call the car box. Okay. Yeah.